Hello, my name is Eric Caldwell. I'm the President and CEO of the Amarant. Before we share today's video, I want to express Amarant's deep appreciation to the Arts Foundation for Tucson and Southern Arizona. Their foundation, along with a few private donors, awarded Amarant a grant to launch a new program that we call the Emerging Indigenous Artists in Residence Program. Artists who are just getting started with their art careers often face difficulties, finding the time, space, and peace they need to really concentrate on their art form. The Emerging Artists in Residence Program provides emerging artists with a cash stipend, as well as a place for the artists and family members to stay while they work on their creative projects at Amarant. The first two recipients in this new program are Derek Gonzalez, who comes to Amarant from the Tonalatham Nation, and Manny Lowley, who comes to us from the Navajo Nation. Derek is a visual artist, and Manny is a poet and creative writer. They both will be staying at Amarin for one month while they work on their projects. I also want to express my thanks to three senior Indigenous artists who have helped shape this new program. Glory Ticini Campoy, Barbara Teller Ornelas, and Duane Moctima are familiar faces to Amarin. They have all exhibited their work here, they have helped us curate exhibits, and they have led some of our programs. As senior artists, they have also all mentored younger artists in their careers. Glory, Barbara, and Duane volunteered their time to help us set up the application process for this new program and also helped us select the first recipients. I also want to thank my colleague, Dr. Maria Martinez, Associate Curator at Amarant, who joined me in helping to launch this new program. Please enjoy this video, which will help you learn a little bit more about these emerging artists. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Eric Caldwell with the Amarin Foundation. I'm the President and CEO and Chief Curator of our museum. And I'm delighted to introduce you today uh, to one of our artists in residence, Manny Lowley. Uh, Manny started uh, his residency here at Amarin in December of 2022 and is continuing to be in residence in January, 2023. Manny is a creative writer. He is pursuing his doctorate right now at the University of Denver in English and Literary Arts. He holds a Master's of Arts and Creative Writing and Fiction from the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, and he received his Bachelor of Arts in English from Kenyon College in Ohio. He's already published many different times in many different places. He's sought after at conferences. His poetry uh, is multilingual, beautiful, thought-provoking, and intriguing, and we were delighted to be able to choose him as one of our uh, new Emerging Artists in Residence recipients uh, this year. Manny, welcome to the Amarin, and can you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and where you come from? Yeah, sure. Um, before that, I just wanted to thank you and also the Amarin um, and the many donors that have been so generous to support this fellowship. Um, it's very important for emerging artists to have space and time to create, and for that, I'm I'm just really grateful, so thank you. Um, to begin, I'll introduce myself um, in my language and then go from there. Yat a Donald Sho, Shea, a she hinchly dot ho bajna aja bashish chain, Twitch eating the shiche dot kia ani the shinale. Nle setka, tog ole, well yenigi, de a yesi nasha, a conde, nle de seca de, de a yesi cast. Um, so hello everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Manny Loli in the English language. I am Salt Clan born for two who came to the water. My maternal grandparents are the bitter water and my paternal grandparents are the towering house. Um, I come from a place called where the water flows through the rocks. Um, it's located in the Eastern Agency of the Navajo Nation. But more specifically, within that larger community, um, I come from a place called where the trees are spread out. And so that's who I am as a Diné person. Thank you. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about um, when you knew that writing was what you wanted to do? I've thought about this for quite some time because it's a standard question that gets asked in interviews. And there are just several moments, many moments where 
writing kind of revealed itself to me as something that was enjoyable, something that was meaningful, something that taught me more about what it means to be human. But I think the most salient aspect of that is storytelling. So within my community, um, stories are a part of every single aspect of life. So for example, one of the most profound and interesting storytellers is my mother. And so my mom has this really interesting thing that she does. And a lot of a lot of Navajo parents do this, is when we're driving somewhere, um, whether it's to Albuquerque or to Gallup or to somewhere else on the reservation, my mom will tell stories. She'll tell stories based on places that we pass by that are significant about people that we pass by who she remembers something about um, or about whatever it is that she's talking about. And so I grew up with these stories. These stories have always been a part of my everyday life and added to that are our ceremonial stories. So in different ceremonies, um, different people will tell different stories based on um, what is called for in that moment. And so these different kinds of stories that range from the everyday to these more um, higher level stories that depict deities in cultural stories, those are really the kinds of stories that I was born into. And so I've always had an interest and a knack for storytelling. And when I say storytelling, that doesn't just mean like once upon a time this happened or the kind of stories we might associate with fiction, but storytelling really encompasses everything. It encompasses poetry, it encompasses photography, it encompasses um, more traditional kinds of storytelling. And so I think that's the, the inspiration behind why I write is because of my mom, because of my grandma, because of my aunties, um, because we just have that love for story and that respect for story. And it's a little bit different in terms of how we think about storytelling um, from a non-Native perspective, right? So when I pick up a book in a bookstore, I might be looking for something that's entertaining or something that will take my mind off of the everyday, right? But with Navajo storytelling, with Diné storytelling, um, a lot of the times the stories are prescriptive. The stories are medicinal. They come into our lives for a reason. And I think that's another major part of, of my storytelling is that sometimes these stories that I write come to me, whether it's in a dream or whether it's um, in something that I'm thinking about throughout the day or some kind of theme or idea that's constantly popping up for me. In, in multiple venues, right? Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think that does a wonderful job of answering that question. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so you mentioned storytelling as prescriptive and, and healing. Um, so as you're writing, are you are you thinking about who's going to be receiving your words and receiving your story? It varies. It varies. Um, sometimes there are certain stories or certain poems that I write for myself because there's something that I'm thinking about, something that I'm dreaming about that I feel like I need to spend some more time thinking about and working through. And so if I'm writing that kind of story or that kind of poem, then I'm not necessarily concerned with audience. I'm more so concerned with how the story is going to work on me. And that phrase, the story works on you, um, I'm actually borrowing from one of my mentors, um, who is the poet and medicine person, Rexley Jim. And so Rexley Jim talks about how, um, in the same line that stories are medicinal, stories also have a power to, to work on the body. And that can mean a variety of things. And one of the things that that saying is tied to is sound. So a lot of the times 
um, in certain ceremonies or certain songs or certain prayers, or even in certain Navajo words, um, when you listen to the sound of it, it elicits some kind of physical response within the body. There's something about hearing that sound coming from the external, traveling internally that connects with something inside of each person. And so that's something that I think about quite a bit when I'm just writing stories or poems for myself, whether that's to heal myself, whether that's to help me get past something, whether that's to help inspire me. Um, I think about that quite a bit. But I also think about that in terms of um, an audience. So one of the biggest audience members that I think about when I'm writing um, is my nephew. So I have an older brother and a younger brother. Um, and my older brother um, has a son. His name is Jaden. And he's my first nephew. And we're very close. And a lot of the times when I'm doing research or when I'm listening at a ceremony or listening to an elder talk or even just listening to my grandma, I'm constantly storing stories and teachings and lessons in the back of my brain that I'm going to return to in hopes that I'll be able to capture the essence of that thing and pass it on to my nephew because that's the way that stories outlive us by passing them on to the next generation. And a lot of the times, the stories that I come across, they might seem like they are only applicable to an older time, right, to, to emergence. But in actuality, when you take the time to listen to the stories and you think about it critically and you think about how they're applicable to our contemporary times, um, you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot and it makes you a stronger person. It makes you a person that is not afraid to take on life and to, to better yourself every day. And so those are some of the things that I wanna pass on to my nephew. Um, but what I'm finding also, because I also direct um, the Creative Writing Summer Program, Emerging Dinner Writers Institute, out of Navajo Technical University. What I'm also finding is that although I write these stories and poems with my nephew in mind or with my family in mind, a lot of the times people also need these stories in their life. Like a lot of the students that come through the Emerging Den Writers Institute, that's one of the comments that they often make is that the stories that I share or the knowledge that goes into organizing that program is something that they needed and they missed either from their childhood growing up on the reservation or not growing up on the reservation. And so it's a very fortuitous thing that although I'm writing for my family, it has the capacity to extend beyond that and to impact people's lives in a positive way. And I think that's the power of storytelling, right? Is, is that power to reach beyond ourselves into the core of our humanity and to help us realize something bigger than ourselves. Thank you. I'm wondering, um, as somebody who's publishing his poetry, uh, is there a difference how you think about the poem being received when it's on the page and someone's reading it by themselves? versus being here, having the opportunity to hear it spoken aloud. Hmm. I think when I am composing a poem, especially when I'm writing a poem in, in Diné, in the Navajo language, I think about sound quite a bit. Because when I read a poem in Navajo, the sound, the cadence, the rhythm, the construction and experience of the language is very different than when I try to read the poem in English. And I think a central part of that is the way that we experience language and the roots of where our language comes from. So for example, if I was to write a poem about water, the word for water in Navajo is tuo. And that word tuo 
has a very interesting onomatopoetic sound quality to it. And the po Dine poet um, Sherwin Batsui has a really um, great example poem of what I'm talking about. Um, in his poem, down the center of the page, he has the word for water repeated multiple times. And so the poem, if you visualize a page, it's literally go going down the center of the page. And it is that one word repeated that says tuo, tuo, tuo. Well, and so when I say that in that kind of repetition, the sound literally sounds like a droplet of water, a water that's dripping, right? But when I say water, 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 it's not necessarily the same kind of impact, at least to my ear. And so when I think about how an audience person, a reader, might come across the poem visually versus sonically, that's the number one thing I think about is sound because you cannot really replicate sound um, when you're translating between Navajo and English. Um, the other thing that I really think about um, when I'm writing a poem, at least visually, um, is line breaks and spacing um, because a lot of my poems deal with different kinds of number sequences that are um, important to Navajo culture. So some of the number sequences that are important to me are four, um, six, seven, 12. Um, and those are important numbers for different kinds of cultural reasons. And, and a Navajo audience member will, will recognize why those are important. Um, and so, yeah, I do think about that. And I do think about that. And I think there's, there's much power when you, you're listening to the poem versus just reading it. I think we're all uh, very excited to be able to hear some of your poetry. So perhaps you could share two poems with us and then maybe we can uh, talk about it a bit. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so the first two I'm gonna share with you are um, work that has already been published. Um, so the first poem was published in Poetry Magazine. Um, they just recently had their first ever um, all native issue of Poetry Magazine. And so this one was featured in there and it was selected by the Diné poet Esther Boleyn. And so I'll read the poem first in Navajo and then in English. Hasisna. Toyasan shema dishnigo. Nahasan shema dishnigo. Nit betlate hasisna. Nahasan Shema Bejay Chahal Yel Ye Hadet Ego Be Yitain Hasisna Nsaha Case Baho one day Hasisna Sad Baho one day Hasisna Hoande Nansa Hoande Nansa And now in English Emergence I call out for Water Woman, my mother. I call out for earth woman, my mother. I emerge from below the earth's surface. I emerge from within sacred darkness that cradles my mother, earth woman's heart. I emerge at the house made of thought. I emerge at the house made of language. I am home, I am home. And the second one I'm gonna read is, um, actually a poem that was turned into a broadside. Um, and so it's available for free as a broadside. Um, so if you visit broadsidedpress.org and then you just type in my name or the title of the poem, it'll pop up. You can print it, put it on your wall. And that's how poetry lives in our communities. Um, so I'll read it first in Navajo and then in English. Kadadin Bazad. Dak eh asnito tradetin bezad atits a ta at a yagad go ta nigo na hastin go betajetni ta at a tene hojoni ye to pech et a hui nanigi betajetni tradetin bezad yis a go shena isna shenag esh to na hastin. Dag eh asnito, 
Hadadin Bazaar, Ah Squajin, Hojuna Sling. The language of corn pollen. From the center of the cornfield, the language of corn pollen sounds. When the corn stalks rustle, as they say, in the wind, they remember the rain. They remember our beauty and our hurt. The language of corn pollen moves within me, woven into mountain song, dawn song, my name in my mother's voice. My tears are raining. From the center of the cornfield, the language of corn pollen makes everything beautiful and harmonious. Wow, that was just beautiful, Manny. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, may I ask where you were when those poems came to you? Um, so the second one, my family, my mom often tells a story about um, her great grandmother, my my grandfather's mother's mother. And growing up, um, my mom didn't have the best of childhoods. And so she used to spend a lot of time um, at her grandmother's and her great grandmother's place. And back then, because those grandmothers were the nucleus of the family, they had a lot of family gatherings and family um, events that happened. And one of the events was um, harvesting corn, harvesting the corn and also harvesting the corn pollen. And my great, great, great grandmother had a huge cornfield. And so every time it was the time to, to harvest, um, all the grandkids would come by and all the adults would come by and they would make a big festival out of it. They would gather this corn, they would cook out. There was a lot of laughter and, and storytelling. But somewhere along the line after those grandmothers passed on, um, that tradition was, was broken. That tradition wasn't continued anymore. And so me and my brothers, we grew up on that story and we always thought it was very beautiful and very moving. And so to kind of capture the essence of that, that time, um, me and my brothers, we started a tradition of planting a cornfield and a garden um, for my mom for Mother's Day. And so this poem comes from that experience. It comes from me and my brothers um, being at my mother's house and us planting the corn, talking to the corn, singing to the corn, um, and really being a part of that legacy that that my mother often tells about. Um, so yeah, so that's that poem. That's where the second poem, Tkhadadin Bazad, or the language of corn pollen comes from, is from that legacy. Um, the first poem, uh, I don't quite recall where I was, but I know when I was writing that poem, um, I was thinking about creation stories. And it's very interesting because on the Navajo Nation, um, there's a split between um, Navajo people that have decided to follow Christianity versus Navajo people that continue to practice our traditional spirituality. And it's an interesting dichotomy because some of the churches on the Navajo Nation um, they're very anti-traditional Navajo spirituality. And Rex Lee Jim has a poem about this, um, where these two men, they're debating creation stories. One of the men says, no, you didn't crawl out of the darkness. You didn't crawl out of the earth. God put you on this earth and God doesn't like it that you're praying to these pagan deities, right? Um, and the other man says, no, I know I crawled out of the darkness. I know I crawled out of the earth because that's what my family has told me since I was little. And that's what their ancestors have told them. And so we're kind of inspired by those two lines of thinking. Um, I decided to write this poem about emergence. And I'm also working on several different poems um, that deal with the idea of darkness. Because a lot of the time, because we're so entrenched in this um, Christian binary of darkness and light and good and evil, 
Um, we often assume that darkness necessarily means something bad. But in Navajo spirituality, darkness is, is something that is holy, something that is a time for uh, rejuvenation and where creation happens. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about those two poems. Thank you. So you've been here for a few weeks now. Um, can you tell us about your experience uh, creating here in the Ameren space? I think the landscape here is very beautiful. It's it's a different kind of beautiful um, than the area where I come from. And I enjoy the drive out here and also taking short walks out here when I've been able to. And one of the things that I'm not used to seeing um, is the wildlife. Like several times now, um, I've seen deer that just come up so close to the house and you can literally be a few feet away from them and just remain perfectly still and watch them or the number of the different kinds of birds that are present. And that's one thing that I often pay attention to is, is the landscape and the, the different kinds of relatives that are present um, within the natural settings that we are in. And so when I've been thinking about the deer and the birds and, and the little pond that's in the backyard here, um, it inspires stories, inspires poems, right? So I'm, so I'm doing a lot of thinking about deer and thinking about water. And so that's something that's been very um, lucrative um, during my time here is, is thinking about the landscape and thinking about it in comparison to, to the area that I've grown up. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about too is, is how much family is so important to me. So I'm here by myself and oftentimes when I have a reading or when I have a community event or somebody wants me to come in and do an event somewhere, um, I almost always travel with a family member. So my mom has come with me to New York City. She's come with me to Washington, D.C. She's come with me to Seattle and other venues. My aunt has come with me as well. And so this kind of experience traveling alone and being alone for so long in this space is definitely a different kind of experience. And it's a it's an introspective kind of experience and something that I'm getting used to. And that's definitely a different part of my creative writing process. And so, yeah, it's going to be an interesting um time to see what comes to fruition. So uh, could you share with us a couple of the works that you've been um, developing here at Amrit? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so I'm currently working on um, my dissertation. And so one of the things that I'm doing for the dissertation is I'm writing in various genres. And one of the genres I'm writing in is poetry. And so for these poems that I'm gonna share, I have been doing a lot of research um, and interviews and readings of different um, cultural stories that have just spoken to me um, or from different conversations that I've had with different Diné storytellers. And so, I'm taking these stories and I'm kind of filtering them through my creative process and, and my muse, for lack of a better word, um, and then I'm translating that to the page. I mean, so right now these poems exist in English, but I'm thinking about how to translate them into Navajo. And that part of my process is very interesting because sometimes the poems will come to me in Navajo, and I'll write them down beginning in Navajo, then later on, I'll have to translate into them into English. And other times, it's the other way around. They come in English, and then I translate them into Navajo. And so, so that back and forth is another interesting thing that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, but okay, I'll share the first one. And these are all untitled, so bear with me. They're going to change over time, so keep that in mind. <laughs> I face the horizon, sunlight glows over the mesa, sunlight spreads its feathers, sunlight warms the earth. 
Birds of many colors begin to sing. Birds of many colors begin to dance. Listen, listen. The sound is beautiful. My tears are raining. My tears are raining. I gather sunlight in my hands. I gather sunlight in my hands and breathe it in. I gather sunlight in my hands and touch my limbs. The sunlight becomes a part of me. Everything has calmed. And so that poem um, is inspired by sunrise. The sunrise out here is very beautiful. And um, the few times I've been able to wake up at sunrise and, and walk out here into the backyard um, and look at the sunrise, it's definitely different than where I come from in terms of the colors. So that, that poem is inspired by the sunrise. Okay, poem number two, untitled. <laughs> the moon is bright. It is full. The moon's light spreads around it like feathers. The moon floats over the ocean. It moves. The moon floats over the lake. It moves. The moon floats over the river. It moves. A baby floats in its mother's womb. A baby floats in its mother's water. The moon is overhead. The mother's water moves. It moves. The baby is forming. The baby is moving. Life moves. Life extends forever. Thank you, Manny. That was just beautiful. Uh, and no thank problem. you. And we all understand that uh, these are works that are still evolving in your very capable hands and in and walking around your mind. Um, we had an opportunity to have uh, lunch, you and I, with our other artists in residence um, a while back. And you had mentioned that sometimes um, the poems that uh, come out of you or the other writings um, remain untranslated and should be untranslated. Can you talk a little? I was fascinated by what you had to say about moving between the two languages um, and your thoughts about that. Could you share those with us? Yes. Um, translation is an interesting phrase and it's an interesting experience. And whenever I say interesting, it's oftentimes conflicting or nuanced in ways that, that are sometimes difficult to negotiate. And so when I think about translation, translation for me doesn't just mean literal translation, like translating from a Navajo word to an English word, but it's also a translation of experience, a translation of a life way a translation of a worldview. And sometimes when I translate or choose not to translate, it is very much fueled by thinking about what is meant only to be understood by a Navajo audience and what is meant to be shared more widely. And so for some of my poems, um, they remain untranslated. They'll just be in English. And sometimes I'll share them with an audience or sometimes I won't share them with an audience. And so I have several notebooks that I carry around. This is one of them, my really portable notebook. And so there are some poems in this one that I will not share with an audience outside of my family. And that's very much a way for me to keep some of the stories, to keep some of the words special to keep them sacred to keep them meaningful right because for some of the terms when you translate it into english it loses some of its essence it loses some of its vitality so an example that i gave at that lunch that we had um, was the navajo nation recently was debating about whether to name some of the landforms on mars after landforms that already exist here on Earth in the Navajo language. And there was this really big, interesting debate between medicine people about whether this should happen. And at the crux of this debate was the idea that 
if you replicate the names that already exist here on Earth and you use them for Mars, those names lose some of their power because in certain prayers and songs and ceremonies, medicine people will use those names to enact healing, to enact protection. But if there are two locations that have that name, then there could be some kind of confusion or there could be some kind of um, loss of confidence when you're citing that name. And one of the very important aspects of language, of, of poetry, of healing, of these songs and ceremonies is belief. You have to have a strong belief in the thing that you're talking about, in the thing that you're saying. And so I think about that debate quite a bit. Like if I'm going to use a Navajo phrase and then translate it into English, is it losing some of its power? Is it losing some of its context? Because a lot of these words come from a specific context. And if you're not aware of that context, then I'm not necessarily sure if you're, if you're able to use it in a way that it's meant to be used or should be used, right? Um, yeah, so, so those are some of the things that I think about. And so sometimes in my poems, I have words that um, are in there that I won't translate. And sometimes people will push back on it and say, well, why aren't you translating? And then my question to them is, well, why do you feel obligated or privileged enough to be accessing that translation when it was never really meant for you to begin with. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, before I ask you to share another couple poems, where, where do you, where do you see yourself going with your, with you and your writing and what do you have to share with the world in the years to come? That's a big question, and that's something that I think about a lot. <laughs> um, one of the things that my grandma always says when she when she when she first was introducing me to the concept of prayer in Navajo thought, one of the things that she often commented on was that, when a person stands towards like the sunrise and they're they're praying for something, or even if they're not praying at sunrise or they're praying in a ceremony, there's a there's an action that you do um, where you sprinkle some corn pollen and you kind of extend it ahead of you. And when you're extending it ahead of you, you're thinking in the future. You're imagining your life unfolding in the future. You're imagining where you're gonna be in however many years and only you know how far your thoughts are going to go how far your prayer is going to stretch so when i think about that image a lot of, of my grandmother kind of just just doing that kind of motion now she does that with all of her grandchildren in mind right there's like so many of us and and i think about that quite a bit and so when i think about where i'm going to go in the future with my writing or my career or or with, with anything aspect of my life, I think the most important thing for me is to always think about my family, and is to always think about my community, and is to always think about um, the privilege that I have in writing in Navajo, because not all Navajo poets can do that. Not all Navajo poets have access to these stories and to these ceremonies. And so when I imagine my life moving forward, I imagine it being rooted in my community, being rooted in my family, being rooted in these stories that I'm gathering and that I'm making a part of my livelihood and my life way and that I'm passing on to my nephew. Um, but more concretely than that, um, ultimately, I want to continue living on the reservation um, near my family to support my family. Um, while also being able to do what I've been doing is to be able to travel to New York City, travel across the country, travel internationally because people want to hear my poems. And how great is that, that I get to live on the reservation, that I get to be a part of my family, that I get to center my being as a Navajo person 
but also have access to the quote unquote outside world through the vehicle of poetry. I think that's the most beautiful thing that, that I can look forward to um, moving forward. Beautiful. Do you have a couple uh, final poems you'd like to share with us? I do, I do. Um, and these are new ones, again, that um, I'm kind of playing with. So I'll share three more and they're very short, so they're not gonna take like an hour or something. <laughs> this next one um, is a poem that has a title. So here goes. The songs came together. The old woman sighed. She shaded her eyes from the sun. There was a huge tree. She sat beneath it. It was a long time ago, she said. I learned songs from my dad. It was many months. I followed him and helped him. That's how the songs came together for me. She looked off into the distance. She began to sing. The earth moved on a hot afternoon. The old woman sang and the earth moved for her. The whole earth is moving now. Can you feel it? And the second one is untitled. It is time for the birds to dance. It is time for the birds to make things right again. Bluebirds dance and sing. In their motion, the people know who they are. In their motion, the world is restored. It is time for the birds to dance. It is time, it is time. The birds dance. I am emotional. And this is the last one that's untitled and very short. <laughs> and again, these poems will probably go through multiple iterations, um, but these are the poems fresh off the press. <laughs> Rain sits on the mountaintop. Plants shake their leaves. Sheeps call out, meh, meh. Life unfolds in fields. Rain walks down the mountain. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Manny. Uh, I think all of our listeners, certainly uh, for me, I found everything you had to share today very moving and very thought-provoking, and I appreciate it very much um, that you would share with us and everybody who is listening in today. So what, as you leave Amarind and go on to your next steps, uh, what... Uh, I hope that Amarin has offered you something to take with you. Yeah. Um, again, I'm just so appreciative for this experience. Um, it's still very astounding to me whenever I get picked for a fellowship or my poem gets published somewhere. Um, because growing up on the reservation, like growing up with no running water, no electricity in a in a mobile home single wide mobile home with just my mom as a single mother. That just seems worlds away from my current experiences as a poet and storyteller. And so I'm just grateful for this experience, grateful for poetry, grateful for language. Um, and I think that's something that I'll continue forward with as, as I leave the Amarind and, and conclude the fellowship. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any place right now where folks can um, get their hands on some of your works or um, listen to any readings that you might be doing in the future? Yeah, uh, most notably, I have an excerpt from my novel in progress. I'm also working on a novel <laughs> um, that's published in the Diné Reader. And so if you pick up a copy of the Diné Reader, it has my work along with um, other Diné writers. Um, that's the most interesting, I think, part of my writing that's available. Um, the other that I mentioned was the Broadside. So if you go to broadsidedpress.org, um, you can download the poem and print it out. Um, and then just most recently, I had a 
several poems published in Green Linden Press, I believe. Um, and those are very new. Um, I actually wrote those poems um, at a different fellowship for the Indigenous Nations Poets. Um, and that fellowship took place in Washington, D.C. And so those are in there. Um, and then forthcoming, I have a chapter um, in the upcoming Navajo Lands Anthology. And so that'll be coming out later this year. Um, and it's a chapter reflecting on what land means to me um, from a Navajo perspective. And so you can check that out when it comes out. Thank you very much, Benny. I am, for one, very much looking forward to reading more and more of everything that you put out. And I hope that um, I hope that we at the Ameren have an opportunity to uh, be blessed with some of your stories uh, in the future. So thank you again for doing this with us today. Thank you. Everyone, I hope that you will um, catch up to Manny and follow along with his writing. Uh, I want to thank um, everyone who helped contribute to our Emerging Artists in Residence. And I hope that this note finds you well and enjoying a very happy and joyful 2023 ahead of you. Best wishes to you all. Take care.